Welcome everybody. I'm Krista's um, The Point Retreat slide. We're talking today about blood sugar control and balance. And so if it's just diabetics that can benefit from this or who, who can benefit from testing their blood sugars or monitoring them? Yeah, great question. Um, so absolutely everyone could benefit from understanding what makes their blood sugars rise and fall. Um, with the statistics as they are around diabetes and pre-diabetes, all of us are really susceptible to it in this day and age. Um, so it's beneficial for everybody to mm -hmm. understand what um, regulates or dysregulates mm -hmm. their blood sugars. Applicable for absolutely everybody to know this. And the reason I have continued to bring in this element of um, blood sugar management into the point retreats is because we focus on lifestyle medicine and it's really nice to sometimes have visual data about how your lifestyle impacts such critical pieces of health like your blood sugars. Mm -hmm. So blood sugars are now not even just a diabetes thing to think about. We think about blood sugars with Alzheimer's, we think about it um, with um, seizure disorders, we think about blood sugar with cancer. I mean, we think about blood sugar with so many different diseases now that you really can't mm -hmm. ignore it if it, you're gonna look at chronic disease. It affects your sleep, yeah. right? Your yeah. dysregulation can wake you up all night. Um, if you have high blood sugars, you have to urinate more often. Yeah. I, I think oh, okay. I actually think diabetic or not, that yeah. is the case. Oh. Um, I think people with autoimmune disease can benefit from lowering their blood sugar. I mean, everyone. everyone. So it's just not healthy yeah. to have blood sugars spiking up high, right. going on that roller coaster, and then just right. being elevated long right. term. Right. And not everybody gets symptoms of having, in particular, high blood sugars. A lot of people are what we say are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to know if you're having elevations. Um, mm -hmm. And some people don't even feel kind of you know, mild lows. So it's really important to actually get a glimpse into what your blood sugars are mm -hmm. doing, um, in particular, if you have a family history, um, or if you have you know, any other chronic disease that you're managing, like you said, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, any of those things, blood sugars impact. And um, this, the reason the continuous glucose monitors are so um, important at the point is we're using them in a preventative way. So medicine does a great job caring for people once they've had a diagnosis, but I wanted to bring these into the point because we, you can do so much with your lifestyle if you just understand what's making an impact. Mm -hmm. And this gives you data so you know that. I mean, you don't always feel direct results or it might take a while to say if you change your nutrition plan. It might take you a couple months mm -hmm. to feel different. This is gonna give you data fairly quick in terms of at least how an, a lifestyle modification is impacting mm -hmm. your blood sugars. So what things do affect your blood sugars? Can you give us a list of things that might impact it? Yep, I definitely can. So life impacts your <laughs> blood sugars, yeah. I would say. Um, parenting. Um, but in all honesty, almost everything you do impacts your blood sugars. So sleep um, and how much sleep you get impacts your blood sugars, quality of sleep. Uh, diet, food, nutrition impacts your blood sugars. Exercise um, or lack of exercise impacts your blood sugars. And another one that we often don't talk about as often as we should is stress. So stress has a big impact on mm -hmm. your blood sugars. So on, on my end, we talk about stress, but I was kayaking. Is yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> is that yeah. considered like a stressor mm -hmm. though? I mean, for real. Well, it's a physical stressor, okay. right? Depending on how aggressively you're kayaking. Right. So we do, and we'll get into that a little more as we dive into our results, but um, Physical exertion does elevate blood sugars. Sometimes we expect that, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but again, it takes um, kind of some training to really understand what is something to pay attention to with your blood sugar results on a CGM versus not. Okay. Um, and patterns and trends become really relevant. Mm -hmm. And when you're just poking your finger, say with a little um, blood glucose poke, it's, it's still important and it's valuable, but it's like a one second view of what your blood sugars are doing over 24 hours. And it's just a teeny tiny snapshot. And the continuous glucose monitor gives you, in particular this one, gives you two weeks of information. So you can get a much bigger look at what's happening. And with, with this CGM, how often is it taking your glucose? Every it's 30 every, seconds, every yep, minute? It's, it's like roughly every 30 seconds okay. to a minute. It's what taking, it's sip every couple of Yes, that's right. <laughs> I even heard it's sipping your blood sugar. <laughs> yeah, every, every 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah. When you have a stressor on your body, whether it's an illness, or you put something in your body that your body doesn't want, or you're working out really hard, your cortisol spikes, and your mm -hmm. cortisol impacts your blood sugar. And so that's why you'll sometimes see stress-related incidences cause those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon for people to have 
to see people with a new diagnosis of type 1 or type 2 after a major life event, like the death of a loved one mm -hmm. or something like that. If, we, if you take the time to go back in someone's uh, life history, mm -hmm. it's not uncommon within a year of being diagnosed that you'll see some big life event happen. Yeah, so the things you pay attention to are the spikes and then the lows, right? Yep, the highs and then the lows. Okay. Um, you know, and sometimes I look for, depending on the individual, I'll look for you know great degrees of variability too. When someone's just going from, mm -hmm. even if it's within a normal range, you know, if they're going you know from that high normal to the low normal, what might be happening there that we can pick up on and, and maybe make some tweaks or modifications. Okay. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not that if you get your CGM results back and you show that you have a low or you show that you have a high, that it means you have diabetes. Right. It does not mean that. Right. Um, so we just help paint a picture of what is causing those things in your life so that then you can modify them um, because the less wear and tear you put on your pancreas over a lifetime, you know, the better chance you have of not developing diabetes or diabetes related blood sugar dysregulation related illnesses. So if you did a CGM on somebody and they didn't know they were diabetic, would that, that, would that be a thing or people wouldn't know that they're diabetic? And so they might not know? Yeah, it's a really good question. So a lot of people walk around with elevated blood sugars that actually would equate to being diagnosed with diabetes for weeks, months, oh, even really? years, okay. um, because it doesn't always produce these really you know, stark symptoms. In the diabetes and endocrinology world, it's not uncommon that we're like, dang, we wish people would get pain with high blood sugars because oh. it, pain prompts people to seek action right. um, or get medical treatment. And um, blood sugars can be elevated without symptoms. I mean, those people that I've seen who have symptoms of elevated blood sugars, I actually try and reiterate, you're, you're fortunate that you get symptoms. Your body is telling you and you're listening, right. and that's helping you come in sooner. So uh, common <laughs> symptoms of high blood sugars are fatigue, um, in extreme thirst, um, more frequent urination, and then common symptoms, some of the common symptoms of low blood sugars would be becoming diaphoretic, which means really sweaty. That is common. People get anxious. People get extremely hungry quickly. They get confused. Um, a rapid heart rate. Those are common symptoms of low blood sugars. Okay. But when you think about the symptoms I just mentioned, especially on the high side, um, those are things that people can attribute to a million things. You know, like, why do I have a headache? Or why am I urinating? You know, a lot of those symptoms are things that can happen just normally with age and or height. Yeah. So people kind of dismiss them and go, oh, that's, you know, from this, that, or the other. I can't figure out why mm -hmm. we don't screen more and test more mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So like you, mm -hmm. I have had to ask, you yeah. know, can you please check my A1C? Yeah. And they're like, oh, you're healthy, Christy, you live a healthy life. Yo, I think that's what they assume. And I assume yeah. that with you mm -hmm. too. And, and certainly that puts yeah. us at an advantage. Mm -hmm. But I have blood sugar regulation mm -hmm. issues sometimes, yeah. especially if I, you know, kind of fall off the bandwagon yeah. for a while. So it is for me really important that mm -hmm. I know. Um, so in someone without diabetes, blood sugars, fasting, meaning you have not consumed anything to eat or drink within typically a 12 hour window, blood sugar should be 70 to 100. Okay. And then two hours post meal or called postprandial, you're, you would want to see numbers kind of in that one to 140 range without so if somebody were to go get their blood sugars checked if, with their normal doctor, mm -hmm. they would give them a CGM, or is that something like unique that you offer to people? Um, good question. So no, CGMs are interestingly enough, and unfortunately enough, not used enough. Okay. So um, they've been around for about 20 years, and the technology continues to get better, mm -hmm. um, and the accuracy continues to get better with the CGMs, but historically, they've been used kind of like the timeline is, and this is why they were developed, is for people with type one or insulin dependent type two. Those are the people that it is a priority that they get a CGM sensor. Okay. But with that being said, um, a lot of payers, meaning insurance companies, you know, in, in those with type two diabetes, we're still often trying to fight with insurance companies to get them covered, which is really unfortunate. Um, so it's becoming, coverage is becoming better and improved as people are, um, you know, understanding more about what the CGMs can do um, and the information that they can provide because it's honestly, and, and everything I've probably done in medicine, which is over my 20 years of being a nurse, quite a bit, this is probably the best um, behavior changing tool that I can find. Mm -hmm. um, really, truthfully, it's just objective visual data that people can really 
make very direct correlations mm -hmm. between highs and lows um, and lifestyle. Well, or I, medication management. Mm -hmm. I should say in, in the, obviously in the acute care setting or outpatient setting, we're doing a lot of medication management with continuous glucose monitors too. But now we're taking them to the point because the sooner you understand what's happening with your blood sugars, the more likely you are to be able to prevent blood sugar issues. So your provider or clinician can prescribe you a individual personal CGM and that um, will give you real-time data and it will only hold your results. I heard that those are challenging to get. Very challenging okay. to get, oh, yeah. So one, um, it's, you know, usually your prescriber is not going to recommend it unless you have type 2 diabetes and even then sometimes insurance doesn't cover it unless you're insulin dependent. And um, but what I always tell people, I'm like, well, just ask your prescriber because they're usually somewhere between two and four hundred dollars out of pocket. So it really means a lot to you. And you know, generally speaking, payers aren't paying for these preventatively. Um, you know, still ask your provider if they're willing to prescribe mm -hmm. one. Some are, some are not. The hard part is too is you have to know what to do with the data. And there are clinicians that just don't feel comfortable interpreting the data, um, and it takes time, right? So you have to really sit with someone and dive into their lifestyle and their logging and go over the results, um, more so with the professional one, um, but even the personal one. And the personal one, you have to know the person well. Um, sometimes people will go a little rogue on medication management as they start to check their blood sugars. And every, you know, if you if someone has had diabetes for a while, that's not maybe the end of the world, but it's not great for everyone. Mm -hmm. The professional one is retrospective, so you wear it, you give the sensor to a healthcare professional to download and interpret, and then um, you get the results and you go over them with a healthcare professional mm -hmm. and they help you interpret the mm -hmm. data and help you understand mm -hmm. what to do with the yeah. data. Like what kind of lifestyle changes do yeah. you make or what kind of medication yeah. changes do you need yeah. to make. And I know like when you sat down with me the first time to go over this, yeah. like I was like, I don't even know what all this means. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So it was nice to have you like sit down and talk about what all this data means. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely helpful. Yeah. And you, you, you notice things on here that the untrained eye wouldn't see, for sure. You know, you just get, you, you yeah. kind of, I mean, you start to look at them. And sometimes yeah. I, you know, I mean, I've seen such extreme CGMs um, that I, you know, I, it's, it's, you sometimes have to really look for things that just can help give people a little information. Mm -hmm. And then some people's are really obvious. Um, so it just kind of depends, you know, mm -hmm. on the individual. Um, and the other thing I like to point out with the CGMs and why I think we sometimes get better buy-in with them is when, regardless of if someone has diabetes or not, when we put a CGM on someone, we don't want you to then go out and like live your best life for two mm -hmm. weeks. And I know that sounds strange because yeah. usually we do, but we want to see what happens on your good days and we want to see what happens mm -hmm. on your not so good mm -hmm. days because for the majority of us, we have days that we do things as we wish we wouldn't. Um, so maybe we don't exercise, maybe we eat a lot more than we intended, we drink more than we intended, you know, yada yada, stress is high. And it's good to capture those days too because then you really get a glimpse of how much that's impacting your blood sugar. So the nice thing with the Libra is you can wear it two weeks. So oftentimes I'll tell people take a week and do what you normally do and take a week and do like the things that you would do around Christmas or Thanksgiving or your high stress times and let's see what's it doing, you know, to your blood sugars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I love talking about this. I'm happy to have yeah. a good time. So thank you.